that you guys are able to join us this Easter Sunday. Uh, if this is your first time here, I'd like to uh, welcome you guys. Uh, I'm Richard. I'm the, the relatively new uh, preacher here at First Christian Church. Um, for the record, Mom, if you're watching, I wore a suit. Don't fly up here and hurt me or ground me. Um, yeah. And to all those who, well, particularly one person who would most likely critique me on how I look on Easter Sunday, because it's Easter, uh, I'm in a suit, so you can't see me. <laughs> I don't want to be. <laughs> I, would take, I would take this off, but I'm worried that there might be something going on that I'm not fully aware of, so, you know, we're keeping it on. Um, I was I was cooking a lot this morning. Um, I made the pancakes, so if they were good, you're welcome. Uh, if they weren't so good, Clay was supervising. Um, <laughs> he's not even here, so it's fine. I can I can dish it out now. Um, he'll hear about it later. It's fine. Um, Easter Sunday has always been one of those things that I I kind of look forward to. It was never my favorite holiday, admittedly. Get it? It's Easter. As a good Christian, you should love the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. But uh, Easter just never really compared with Christmas, right? Like Easter, it's like kind of here today and gone the next. Christmas is like an entire month, and so that's pretty awesome. Uh, and they're both about Jesus, so it counts. Um, one of my least favorite things was uh, sunrise service. I loved it. <laughs> loved it. There's a reason only one person said it, or two. <laughs> um, it's just not the majority. <laughs> Especially when I was in high school, right? Um, I was in high school, and um, the way that, e that sunrise service always went, it's like Monday through Friday leading right up to Easter, except for Friday because it was like Good Friday, so typically we were off. Um, so I guess technically Friday was my, my Sunday that day because I would look forward to sleeping in on the weekends, right? Because uh, the way that it worked, my mom was uh, very against me riding the school bus. Uh, she was like, you know, people are misbehave on the school bus. I was like, Mom, there's no way it's that bad. And I'm sure if some of you were ever on the school bus, you're like, it's that bad. Um, but. I was, I was always like, I, I was never able to, to just ride the school bus. I couldn't walk. Uh, my mom always had to take me. And lucky me, my mom always had to be at work early in the morning, and so I had to be at school early in the morning. So, you know, 5.30 rolls around Monday through Friday, and I'm waking up Monday through Friday, and then good old sunrise service comes around on a Sunday morning where I get to do the same thing on my weekend. And I was just never a huge fan of that. And on, on top of that, if any of you guys have ever done sunrise service, you know that it's not actual service. Right? Like, if it was a sport, it's your warm-up before the game. So you get the sunrise service at, you know, 6.45, 7 o'clock in the morning, and you're like, I got my church in, and they're like, no, you didn't. This is just the warm-up. Yeah. Get ready because we got a 45-minute sermon coming in about after this 30-minute one. And I'm like, 30 minutes? I'm not a warm-up. Like, the only thing that ever made sunrise service worth it was the donuts they had. Um, just being honest, I know I shouldn't, but it's just true. <laughs> for for me, when I was in high school, the only thing I looked forward to when it came to sunrise service was the, the donuts. Um, but I love the tr the tradition, right? A lot of people, they, they have uh, different Easter traditions. They, they meet with family. Uh, for me, we always have like a family get-together, right, at the church. Uh, some people, because of different – I'm originally from Houston, so if you didn't know that, you do now. Um, which also made Sunday service terrible because it was a 30-minute drive to get to the church, so I had to wake up even earlier. But anyway, enough bashing on Sunday service. Um, we always met for like a, a late lunch, early dinner kind of thing. We would always do Easter egg hunts um, and that kind of stuff. And the way that it worked was one of my aunts would kind of 
um, set the entire thing up, right? And so she had all these gifts. Uh, whoever collected the most eggs would get to go first. For every egg that you had, you got to trade the egg in for a prize. And if you were a real winner that day, you found the five with a ten dollar egg. You were a real winner, because then you could go to the uh, the dollar store and buy all the prizes that you didn't get to get earlier. And so, I've always enjoyed the Easter season, right? But when I was younger, um, the reason for Easter always kind of got overshadowed by the Easter egg hunts, the prizes that could be won. If I ever got to eat dessert, the dessert, because it's dessert, the cakes, the pies, the turkey, the ham, all of that stuff started to kind of overshadow what Easter was about. Oftentimes we get so caught up in celebration that we forget the reason that we celebrate. And that was especially true for me when I was middle school, high school, and younger. Basically up until about where I'm at now, <laughs> it was like that. But if you've been following along with us, we've been talking about some of the different predictions that Jesus made about his death. And most recently, last Sunday, we talked about how Jesus predicts the resurrection. The disciples, it, the, the, the scriptures, the different gospels talk about how they didn't understand what Jesus was teaching. They didn't understand, they couldn't grasp the concept that somebody who was dead would rise again. Most importantly, that the Messiah who came to save them from oppression in their mind was going to die and be crucified. Because that's not what the Messiah does. The Messiah comes and overthrows governments, saves us from oppression. That's what the Messiah does. He doesn't die. And Jesus tries to stress he dies, but he resurrects. I, I, I came across, as I'm sure some of you most likely have, uh, on Facebook, where, or maybe it was Instagram, something like that. Uh, there tend to be a lot of skeptics that start to really come out of the woodworks right around this time. Uh, I remember seeing this one post that said, uh, just a reminder for the record, people who die don't come back from the dead. And at first I was like, I was like, you don't even know. You don't know. Like, you just don't believe. And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, that's true. Like, people who die don't come back from the dead. It's kind of why this is a big deal. That's kind of the point. Is that Jesus claimed to be somebody who had power over death, and so it only really makes sense, and he's really only that person if he can, in fact, have power over the dead. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, Matthew chapter 28 is the final chapter uh, of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's this it, it's Matthew's account of what happens on the resurrection morning and some of the events that take place throughout that day. So picking up and uh, starting in verse 1, it says this. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead. The angel told the woman, Don't be afraid, because I know you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. 
They go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus told them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Now I want to put a quick pin in that. So right off the bat, we have Mary Magdalene and the unfortunate soul who always gets known as the other Mary. Um, they are approaching the tomb. As they get there, an earthquake takes place. An angel appears, rolls the stone away. If you remember, uh, or if you, you follow along with our, our Facebook, I talked briefly about the, the point of the stone uh, yesterday in a, in a brief little devo. Uh, the people who wanted that place there were afraid that what Jesus said was going to come true. And so they had this stone placed, and even a stone with its guards weren't enough to hold Jesus where he was. So they get there, and they meet an angel, and in typical angel fashion, they're very quick to say, don't be afraid. Unless you're a guard, be afraid and pass out. Um, but that's on, that's on you for being on the, the wrong side of history. Um, but it's interesting, because they show up expecting there to be a dead body. Different uh, gospel accounts have some, some different dialogue that takes place uh, between the women that approach the tomb and uh, various people, uh, the angel, the, uh, and ultimately Jesus, who they, they seem to be a, a gardener. And one of the things that I find interesting is in a different account, they go up and they say, please, if you've moved him, just tell us where. Because even the ones who had faith that went to the tomb, even when they got there, they were still assuming that the dead do not come back to life. They have to be given a divine message that it's not that way with Christ. That Jesus does, in fact, come back from the dead. Picking up in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 28, it says, As they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the, the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, Say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ears, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. They took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. Um, very interesting situation that takes place right here. Many skeptics, uh, from the Jews of the time of Jesus to people now, they have all come up with different ways to kind of refute the fact that the tomb was in fact empty. You have several different possibilities, and one of the, the leading theories, apart from the actual resurrection, is that his disciples came and stole Jesus' body. There are some really interesting ones out there. Some people think that, that maybe it wasn't actually Jesus who went into the tomb. They switched his body during the crucifixion, and there's, there's not a whole lot of merit to that one. Uh, so as far as... Arguments that might have some merit, I would say this is probably the, the best argument that would have merit apart from the resurrection. But the issue with that argument is that the whole point of the guards being there and a giant heavy stone being placed there was so that the thing that they're lying about could not happen in the first place. As a soldier, it was highly frowned upon for you to fall asleep during your post. And if any of you have 
participated in the armed forces, one, thank you for your service, uh, and two, you know that this is still true. If you get placed somewhere and they tell you that you're supposed to be there, you better not be falling asleep. And so there's, there's some merit to it, but not enough for me to sit here and say that this is the way that it is. I don't have a, a, enough belief in this story to hold true. So really the only one that I can think of is the resurrection took place, as the Bible says it did. But picking up in verse 16, it says, The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came, uh, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And right there, the curtains close on Matthew's gospel. Jesus shows up with uh, according to Matthew's gospel, uh, we see that more teaching takes place with Jesus during the book of Acts and, and uh, things of that nature. But here in Matthew's gospel, Jesus appears to his disciples with a final instruction to go out into the world proclaiming what they've seen. Now, I hesitate to uh, always dive into the topic of apologetics, uh, which is a fancy word for defending the faith. Um, but I, I find it very necessary kind of in the world that we live in that's based on science and fact and basically anything that happens outside of those never happened. Um, and so because of that, I want to kind of tackle some of these issues that arise with the resurrection. If you want to go more in depth, there are plenty of good books. Uh, God's Crime Scene is a, is a great book by, um, his name is escaping me right now, uh, but if you look up God's Crime Scene, uh, J. Warner Wallace, that's his name. Uh, that's a, a apologetic view of the creation of the world, and he has one called Cold Case Christianity, in which he analyzes the gospel accounts and the gospel messages and ultimately points to why Jesus was who he said he was beyond reasonable doubt. And so by, by the same author, another good book is uh, The Case for Christ. Uh, if you don't like to read, you can watch the movie. Uh, the movie deals with a lot of how he came and gathered some of his information to talk about some of these different topics. Um, but a lot of people have obviously tried to discredit the resurrection of Christ. People have made it their life's work. I think of uh, Richard Dawkins, who has written countless books on atheism, uh, that strive to discredit and disprove the resurrection of Christ. And I want to be very clear. The reason that this happens is because, honestly, if we can just be perfectly honest with ourselves, if Jesus came and he lived and he died as he said he would and he raised to life as he said he would the way that we live our lives has to change if Jesus came and proclaimed a message of faith and, and salvation um, for us to accept this and for us to understand this beyond a reasonable doubt it's one a message of hope and two it's one that involves changes in our lives. Because if Christ came to die for us and raise to life for us, then the natural response is that we live our lives for him. So to dive into some of these topics, um, just some quick little nuggets of information as to why the resurrection is credible. For one, in the Gospel of John, 
After Jesus raises from the dead, he appears to the disciples all but one. We've given him a, a rough nickname for honestly one of the most important things to happen. Doubting Thomas was not there when Jesus shows up to his disciples. He wasn't there. He didn't see. And so when everybody is telling him something that basically this guy who was just horribly crucified and horribly tortured, when they tell him he's back, he's alive, he rose from the dead, believe it or not, he wants proof. Which gave him the name Doubting Thomas, but if we can all be honest, we'd all be Doubting Thomas. If somebody came up to you and told you that somebody that you cared about who had passed away was back to life and walking around, you'd probably want to have some proof. You'd probably want to see it for yourself. And so Jesus comes to Thomas, and Thomas places his fingers where Jesus' wounds were. So this is not a illusion. This is not some mass hysteria where people see that see something that's not really there. Thomas is able to physically touch the wounds. Now, maybe they were on something, right? Maybe they, they was, there was mass hysteria. Maybe that's why only the, the 12 saw him. So how do you explain the hundreds that will go on to see him later? The book of Acts, Jesus appears fully resurrected in flesh, not as a ghost. Which is ironic because Jesus, when he confronts Thomas for his doubt, he is very quick to explain, you can touch my flesh and see that I am not a ghost. You can see that I'm not a figment of your imagination, but that I am real. That I'm really here. And with the 500 that see him in the, the account of Acts, the same thing happens. Now, if you go on to read The Case for Christ or watch the movie, um, Lee Strobel is the author and the one who does it. And he was a hardcore skeptic who sought to disprove Christianity, sought to disprove that uh, the resurrection actually happened. And as he was doing his research and as he was looking into it, he came across the uh, belief, the faith, that the resurrection actually happened. Because he talked with different experts, different health experts, uh, different psychologists of, of the time and said... Have we ever seen any kind of account of mass hysteria where everybody who's present all seems to have seen the exact same thing? And the response is no to our knowledge that's not happening. There's a, there's a funny video um, on YouTube you can, you can watch. Uh, it's by a group, I think they go by Lutheran Satire, I think is the name of it, but they make different videos, uh, and one that they have about, uh, it, it's a debate between these animated characters that they like to, to use to kind of prove points, and these animated characters get into a debate with an animated Richard Dawkins, who I, I mentioned earlier, um, and Richard Dawkins is seeking to prove to them that the resurrection didn't happen and that it's not verifiable. And they, they ask him, why, why is it not verifiable? And he says, well, because dead people don't come back from the dead. And their response was, except for when they do. And his response was, but they don't. And he was like, they were like, well, how do you know that they don't? And they're like, because... And Richard Dawkins goes, because it's not happened before. And he said, they, they respond, well, Jesus rose from the dead. And he responds with, well, no, he didn't. And they're like, so basically, you say that dead people don't rise from the dead because you automatically discredit people that have. Which is interesting logic, right? It's easy to say that something never happens when you automatically discredit something that happened. 
right? If if I said that um, because everybody likes to tease me about Ford, uh, I'm driving one. If I said that nobody drives a Chevy, and you're like, there's Chevys parked outside, and I said, those aren't real Chevys, those don't count. I can stick with what I want to say, and I can stick with my false premise if I just simply keep denying evidence for this happening. And so the same thing has happened time and time again with the resurrection. Yeah, it's obvious that dead people don't come back from the dead. That's why it's been a big enough deal for it to be reported. Right? Because when Lazarus comes back from the dead, that gets reported. That's a big deal. When Jesus comes back from the dead, that's a big deal. It gets reported. So if we say that, well, it just never happens, well, yeah, if we say that these didn't happen and these were made up, then, well, yeah. If we automatically discredit what did actually happen and say that it didn't, then we can stick to our false premise. But the challenge here is that if it did happen, then that changes everything. The way that we live, the faith that we have, everything changes if the resurrection happened. And if you uh, choose to kind of look beyond some of these, these breadcrumbs and some of these little nuggets that I've, I've given, I think you'll come to the same conclusion. That beyond reasonable doubt, Jesus was who he claimed he was. And so that being said, if Jesus was who he said he was, the way that I live my life is based on the commands that he gives. So, in similar fashion to what the Great Commission says, I want to extend an open invitation to you guys as we move into our next song. So if there is a uh, decision that you want to make or some kind of prayer that uh, you would like to uh, have happen due to something going on in your life, uh, any reason that you might want to come forward, uh, you are welcome to at this time. Uh, I'm going to pray and the band will come up, uh, lead us in the final song, and I will just be right here to uh, my right, to your left, uh, and you guys are more than welcome to come up and uh, have those conversations with me. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your Son who came and died on the cross so that we could be saved. God, I, I think it's pretty clear beyond reasonable doubt that your Son was who he claimed he was. God, that your Son is the Messiah who came and was tortured, was beaten, was spit on, crucified for our sins. And God, that he raised to life so that one day we can join him in the same resurrection. God, we thank you for your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.